In simplest term, cryptocurrency is a medium of an exchange that is digital, encrypted, and decentralized. And so unlike the US dollar or maybe the euro, there is no central authority that manages or maintains the value of cryptocurrency. And so I, I kind of like just to give you guys a better idea of like uh, what a medium exchange would be. So we can kind of like think about our transactions just as a country um, in stages, right? So when society was in the early stage, we didn't have money, right? Yet that wasn't the thing. We would trade items, right? But then, you know, maybe I'll trade you my horse for your grain or whatever the case may be. Um, but then we started to realize that what we value versus what you value technically always wasn't on the same page, right? So then we moved into trading currency or coins, right? So now we could trade our horse for maybe a piece of your gold. And you know that this piece of gold will have value to someone else. And, and we grow more than 40 different fruits, vegetables, and herbs that we grow organically. And so what we're doing is we're providing high quality, fresh, nutrient dense produce to Detroiters that is grown by black people. And uh, we're setting an example of what a closed loop economy, at least on a microcosmic level, might look like. Because right now in our community, as anybody who lives in Detroit knows, the vast majority of the grocery stores in our community are owned by Chaldeans or other people from the so-called Middle East. Well, hello everyone and welcome to this wonderful, fantastic Friday with Urban Interest. I am your host, Angela Matthews. We have great stories as well as wonderful guests today. Uh, we're going to talk about the great resignation. We've been bringing you this story for quite a while now. And yes, it's true. People are quitting their jobs in droves. And then we're going to talk about Omicron, the variant, the, the COVID variant, another one. And then have you ever heard of Soul Train? Kind of got that look today, huh? We're going to talk about the 50th anniversary of Soul Train. A lot of people want to know about cryptocurrency. We'll have a guest to talk about that as well as D-Town. Do you know what that is? A guest that will talk about that as well. So stay put, stay connected. We will be right back with these stories as well as guests. Movies, documentaries, TV shows, local, national, and world news, history, and culture. No one tells your story better than UIN because we are you. With us, you can become more than a consumer. You become a keeper of the culture. Go to UINTV.net, pick a channel to support, and subscribe today. Do it now. Can I ask you a question? Uh, Why do you want to get the COVID-19 vaccine? I don't like getting sick. The virus will die. It will be easy to not catch it. Keep my family safe and keep playing soccer. Because I love being vaccinated. What's your hope for everyone? I hope everybody gets the vaccine. To keep safe and strong. Be like happy, having fun everywhere. Everyone stay safe and hope you get the vaccine. Oh, I love that particular commercial. When he says, I love getting vaccinated. Our kids are speaking, but are we listening? All right, let's get to our stories. The great resignation. This is the phenomenon where people are quitting their jobs in droves, but this could have a negative effect and impact on President Biden's spending plan. The shortage of workers could throw a monkey wrench in the plan to improve the nation's infrastructure. As certain parts of the country scramble for workers, the great resignation seems to be in full effect. Let's take a listen. In Michigan, winter is coming. 
but the snowplow drivers aren't. It's tough to get people. We have been looking high and low. As the American economy tries to dig out from under the pandemic, competition for workers is fierce across the country. In the past, we've just had lines of people. You know, you, you'd, you'd get turned away more often than you'd get a chance to even get an interview. And, and then this is really unusual. It's a workers' market right now. We know that. The White House says lingering COVID concerns and childcare problems created by the pandemic are keeping some Americans out of the workforce. Others, they say, simply want something better. Many people across the country feel this is a good time to change jobs, right? To look for a more competitive job. What I'm saying is ultimately that's a good thing. But it could be a bad thing for the fragile economic recovery. A record 4.4 million Americans quit their jobs in September, up from 4.3 million in August. Wow. Can you believe that? People are quitting their jobs, but listen, employers, you got to listen to what's going on. You got to offer some better wages. You got to offer some better benefits. It's kind of, I think, really simple, but maybe it's not. So the $1 trillion spending plan is the largest federal investment in infrastructure in more than a decade, 10 years. So here in Michigan, it's snowing. You get stuck, roads are not plowed, you can't blame anyone. Folks just are not applying for the jobs, but we hope that that will change. Omicron, the COVID-19 variant that has had the world on edge, has been discovered in the U.S. and scientists don't seem to know yet what kind of impact it's going to have. Let's take a listen to what they're saying. Off the table. Yes, for the now. Product, yes. Why, why is that? Well, because we're able to, if people are vaccinated and wear their masks, there's no need. Well, all right. It seems as though the variant has since been discovered in five COVID cases in New York City. This year marks a milestone in American pop culture and it marks the 50th anniversary of Soul Train. I don't know about you, but I grew up on Soul Train every Saturday, loved it, watched it for that one hour or so. The show was a cultural phenomenon that started with one man's dream to showcase black music talent. Let's take a look. Take one. Hi, I'm Don Cornelius, and what you're about to see is a very special program. It started with a vision to celebrate Black artists Super fly. and Black culture. Soul Train was created, produced, and hosted by the late Don Cornelius, who died in 2012. Welcome aboard. We're going to be dealing some good feeling your way for the next 60 minutes. Before his death, he talked about the power of his program. It was overnight hot. Almost in minutes, every black person in town knew about it. Not because it was such a wonderful show, but because it was theirs. I don't know about you, but I love Soul Train. Thank you so much, Mr. Don Cornelius. Um, we will forever remember your legacy. And I know that people still do Soul Train line dances. They make that Soul Train line at particular celebrations and they still honor the legacy of Don Cornelius. Soul Train aired in syndication from October 22nd, I'm sorry, October 2nd, 1971 to March 27, 2006. But as I said, the legacy still moves on. I got that kind of Don Cornelius look, wouldn't you say? Listen, we're going to take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about cryptocurrency and D-Town. Now that the vaccine is available for children five and up, why do you recommend it? Kids are part of the community and they can spread COVID. 
We're seeing both healthy children getting sick from the virus as well as children with underlying health conditions. They can easily bring the virus home to other people that are vulnerable and make them sick as well. This vaccine can change that and keep children safe. It's essential that your children get vaccinated to protect them, to protect your families, and to protect those in the community around you. Nine one one, what's your emergency? Oh my God, a child just died. Signal thirteen involving a child. The medicine route. It is time, time to put the guns down. We've had enough. My future. My future. My future. Our futures are in your hands. Don't put the guns down. When I play, walk to school. Visit my friends. I want to feel safe. It's time. Time to end gun violence. I love the gun. Adult, this is not a request. We demand that you protect us. Put the guns down. We have hopes, dreams, goals. Don't let a split second of anger with someone else take away my entire life. Help us live. Help us thrive. Help us build a better future. All right, everyone, you are back with Urban Interest. There is something that we talk about a lot. I don't understand it. And I'm hoping that with our guest today, by the time that we wrap up this conversation, we will know a lot about cryptocurrency. You know, that conversation has been blazing for a while now, but we have Miss English Reed, who's going to tell us and kind of educate us on cryptocurrency. Hello, Miss Reed. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here with you guys this morning. Good. Now, listen, listen, you're a young millennial. Knowing about this cryptocurrency, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us how you got into cryptocurrency. Sure, sure. So hello, everyone. My name is English with an I. Um, obviously, I'm a millennial. I'm from Detroit. I actually have an organization called Millennials Versus Everybody, and we empower and equip millennials with intellectual tools, professional resources, and civic engagement opportunities to lead greater lives. And um, being an entrepreneur, I really, you know, got to learn about what are some of my other friends doing, like what do I see that they're doing, and one of my friends who I used to go to Bible study with in college, um, I saw that he was investing in the foreign exchange market, and he was like making a lot of money trading, and I'm like, how did, how, like, what is a foreign exchange market, how do you even know, like, how to make money in this space. And so he told me that he was a part of a platform called I Am Master Academy. And they pretty much teach people about investing into foreign exchange, but an additional crypto market. And I'm like, wow, this is awesome. So, um, you know, I really got to see his life changing and like what this skill really did for him. And so I joined I Am Academy and I started to learn more about the crypto space. And so I started trading back in 2018, but I really like wasn't paying a lot of attention to crypto probably until like um, last year, maybe like 2020, like maybe right before the pandemic hit. Um, and I've just seen it like going by storm, right? And I've been like, hey, this is something, even if I don't feel like I fully understand every little intricate thing, I see that this is this is going somewhere, right? I, I'm following the money. I've been able to learn a little bit more about market cycles, you know, why people are trusting into crypto. It's been able to make me money, my friends money. And so honestly, it's just the way of the future, right? And I'll talk a little bit about how our trading has changed over time. And like we see what's going on in the metaverse. We see what's like going on. And so whether we fully feel confident or comfortable with it or not, I say it's better to take the chance to kind of jump in to feel like this is something I want to educate myself on because obviously millionaires are being created. Um, it's something that people are talking about even more. And so I was like, hey, people aren't just going to have success in front of me and I don't know what's going on. So I was like, I've got to get involved. <laughs> All right. Now, I, you know what? I've, I've heard about it. Cryptocurrency, it sounds big. 
-hmm. It sounds mysterious and it sounds complicated. So what is cryptocurrency and how does it work? Sure. Uh, So in simplest term, cryptocurrency is a medium of an exchange that is digital encrypted and decentralized. And so unlike the US dollar or maybe the Euro, there is no central authority that manages or maintains the value of cryptocurrency. And so I, I kind of like, just to give you guys a better idea of like uh, what a medium exchange would be. So we can kind of like think about our transactions just as a country, um, in stages, right? So when society was in the early stage, we didn't have money, right? Yet that wasn't the thing. We would trade items, right? But then, you know, maybe I'll trade you my horse for your grain or whatever the case may be. Um, But then we started to realize that what we value versus what you value technically always wasn't on the same page, right? So then we moved into trading currency or coins, right? So now we could trade our horse for maybe a piece of your gold. And you know that this piece of gold will have value to someone else. And so we can continue to make trades and exchanges like that, right? And then we moved on to banks, right? So we could move our coins and change it now into paper money, but paper paper money is just paper, right? Or even sometimes plastic now. So it wasn't that the value like necessarily came in the actual form of like the money, but it was more of like the, the value we gave it because of what government said, right? This $10 bill, you know, equals $10 in value, right? And so the banks essentially are keeping these receipts, right? And so then now tech started to improve and now we don't, we barely even see money, right? People are like, I don't carry money. I just got my credit card, right? Like, and now we're buying and selling online that we don't even see this money. We don't see a coin, we, you know, we're not even really seeing a dollar anymore. And so now we are in the era of the most convenient era of exchange, which is cryptocurrency, which is 100% virtual, and it's essentially the transfer of digital assets. Okay, transfer of digital assets. When you were talking, I remember it brought me back to a time of the barter system. Mm-hmm. You know, we bartered, like you said, I have something of value, you have something of value. So we barter and exchange for that particular item way back in the day. Yeah. So now here we are in the digital market doing the same thing, bartering, uh, trading. Yeah. Kind of so. Okay. So, so there's another, uh, um, big name that's out there and that it seems mysterious and that's Bitcoin or Bitcoin. Yeah. So, so what's the difference between the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin? So Bitcoin is a type of cryptocurrency. So there's uh, over like 4,000, different forms of crypto and they're almost kind of like startups you know if you will but bitcoin is the most valuable one it's the longest standing one it's the most trusted one and it's the most backed one right so some people will invest in um smaller cryptos to maybe like kind of like get a flip out of them like you know they, they may not see that oh this crypto will last and last forever right um, whereas Bitcoin is something that people are like, I'm going to keep my stake in and invest into it. And um, it's some, it's, it's more of a crypto that's more trusted and it has people that are backed by it. And Bitcoin is the one that really uh, moves the market, like in general, if Bitcoin mm-hmm. is going up, the rest of the cryptos are kind of going up, it's going down, then the rest of them are going down. It's kind of like the, the head honcho in the crypto world. Okay, Bitcoin. I'm have to, so this is all legal, right? This is all of this yeah. is legal. Yeah, okay. it is all legal. And honestly, like a lot of people tend to like the crypto space more because it is decentralized and it is very secure. And crypto uh, comes from what they call cryptography, right? Um, which essentially is. It's a method of using encrypted and decrypted secure data. So anytime you decide to buy 
or sell crypto. Um, it happens in the blockchain. And I guess like an easy way to kind of understand the blockchain is um, when you buy or sell something, it kind of comes up like on this, on this block and it's going to give you the information of who it's from and, and then who sent it. And so we have something called a ledger, which kind of records all these transactions, but it's like repeated like thousands of times by Bitcoin miners. So like if you were to do something in your bank and someone like hacked it, then it's, it's just that one account versus like when you're transferring Bitcoin, it's like you can see it on say like multiple computers. So you're able to tell like if there's some fishy business going on because you can compare it to a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, whereas in the banks, you know, you can't. Um, I would say a, another advantage is, again, we don't need the banks a, as our, um, our like processor anymore, right? So we don't need to do bank fees or, you know, very little transaction fees with crypto. Um, and there's really no like interest rates, right? So I think like a lot of people really like that um, and how secure it is. And people can see, okay, I can I can store my money here and it can grow, right? Like it, it can go up in this coin, like it's gonna to continue to create increase value. Um, and so I think, you know, people just like, like that idea a little bit better of like the banks not having to have their hands so much in our transactions or telling us how much we can uh, send and or not or even some banks denying people to even open up an account there right there is no like deny here you just kind of open up set an account like they're they're not you know um looking at you as a uh judging you based upon like your skin and what you look like or you know any of those things that some people may experience um within the banking system they they don't have to deal with that okay so you just answered my next question which was how is it better than regular money and you did bring up some good points about um not being judged by the color of your skin those bank fees because they those nsf fees <laughs> can get very enormous and basically can wipe out your bank account. Yeah. And then also those, there's those transaction fees. So the little things add up. And from what I'm hearing, that's not the case with the cryptocurrency. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah. Okay. So who's controlling this particular market? Is, is it the, 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 like your people like yourself, just the regular people who are in this market, you control it. Yeah, so like right now, um, you don't see like, maybe like in the stock market, um, you know, these big companies and stuff, they're really like controlling and kind of like pushing the market and stuff. Like there's really a lot of people who are like you and I, who are engaged in a crypto market where like all this, um, big money that's that would typically be controlling other markets they're not really doing that and it's almost kind of like people say it's like the people's coin or whatever because like we we do play a big role just like people like you and I who decide to get engaged in the crypto market so it has a lot to do with just everyday people but now you see like okay how big it's getting that now banks and um, bigger institutions are interested in getting in like before they really weren't and you know they see how that could tackle with their kind of their normal way of doing things right so it wasn't something that was always you know liked by them but they're, they're saying like you know my educator would say like you know it's not too late to get engaged in it but it's really a better time to get engaged in it before all the big banks and the big money come and then shoot the price all the way up and you know your involvement in it you know you might not be at like bitcoin right now let me see where it's at um bitcoin right now is at fifty six thousand dollars get invest in the Bitcoin, you wouldn't have to have $56,000, right? You can buy like a Satoshi or a part of the coin or a fraction, a small fraction of the coin, and it's still going to go up. But let's say when this big money and, and stuff comes in and like there are more people who are present, that's going to skyrocket the price like 
even more, right? I mean, there's predictions that Bitcoin will get up to $100,000 at the end of the year. I know like at the end of 20, was it at the end of 2019, I believe, Bitcoin was like at like $24,000 and then it got up to $64,000. And so if you had even invested, uh, even if you had put in like $1,000 in a Bitcoin in 2013, you would have made over $100,000 today. Um, and that's, and any, anytime you're making an investment, whatever you invest, you have to be willing to lose or willing to double. And I, and that's really with any investment, like, is it something that you can, it's a risk, right? You're taking a risk. There's nothing like guaranteed in anything, but still, um, I think we were just like kind of nervous and scared about it. Or even like, like I said, at the end of like last year, it was around like $24,000. And some, some people were getting really scared because I thought Bitcoin is going to go all the way up to here. But there's an emotional cycle that happens within the market um, from people kind of not knowing like, oh, it, you know, is it really going to go up? And then it's shooting up and people get excited and they have this euphoria and they're, they're buying more because it's, it's now at the high. But anything that goes up has to kind of come down to rebalance itself um, each and every time. And so... That's the beauty of about me being a part of an academy and, and me having these crypto mentors is things happen and they change so rapidly, but just the human psychology of investing is very, very present um, in the crypto market. And you'll kind of see like it kind of being stagnated and then it's going up and then it, then it you know, it kind of comes down and it'll retest that area and it'll, you know, kind of shoot back up. And so um, I know I was talking to, um, one of the, um, one of the people from the show, like right before it came and he's like, you know, well, I see like Bitcoin is kind of going down. Like, you know, when will I know if it's a good time to get in or when is it going to go back up? Right. I can't necessarily predict that, but I have the knowledge to be able to look at history and see what kind of happened in the market cycle when this happened back in 2013 like what did it what, what what did it look like because the market repeats itself right i mean and i think just in life sometimes trends and styles and things tend to repeat itself and so um i think i think there's kind of like a lot to learn behind it but i think the biggest thing uh for people to take away is that this is really where the world is going right we've seen just our trading in general, how it has evolved and how much technology is present in what we have now. And so if people can get away from banks, if we can have a more secure way to trade, a faster way to trade, um, that's what people are interested in. And even I know you guys may have seen like how Facebook has turned into metaverse, like people are buying property in this virtual reality, all that. Every transaction has to go through cryptocurrency. So if we see that this next vaccine or, you know, if the vaccine doesn't work towards this next thing, we're all going to be in lockdown again. And so what's going to happen? We're all now going to be adopting this virtual world, right? To be able to go play chess with someone who's in England and you guys are playing in New York, right? Like that's crazy. Like it's, but it's, it's mind blowing to think like where future is going. And so you already kind of see people adopting this metaverse thing and like seeing like the world has changed like things are getting a little bit different and if you know that some some people value tech technical property more than just the real world right so like i i can trade on my phone and i can make money on my phone sometimes easier than i could like just right here right now where we're so into social media and we value this virtual world, like we value online so much. And so you'll see that people are literally buying real estate in the metaverse and it's all done through cryptocurrency. And so whether you 100% understand it or not, whether you 100% trust it or not, this is what's going on and this is the future. And so I like, I tell everyone, you know, take your, take, you know, learn a little bit more about it. But while you trying to figure out also many details and getting comfortable, I'm making money. 
right? So it's like, it, it's time to be like, okay, I see what's going on. And even that was the same thing for me. I may not know every little single detail about every little single thing, but I know enough to say that I won't be left in the dust. Too many times we feel like, oh, we missed the Amazon stock or we missed the Facebook stock or whatever the case may be. It's like, don't miss what's going on in the crypto space. I mean, you see that um, in some places in Mexico, it's now uh, a form of currency, right? Countries are adopting this, right? NBA players are getting paid by it. Elon Musk, right? At one point, be out to be the richest man in the world than Jeff Bezos because of cryptocurrency. But then some people are still nervous about it. We're still scared about it. Bitcoin was at $8,000, $11,000, and it went up to $64,000. Some people hear about this SHIB coin, right? The thing that people don't like about Bitcoin is that it's volatile, right? It can go up, it can go down, you know, prices sometimes speculate, right? Um, and it's and it's still taxable by law, which they're still getting that all together. It, you know, the the whole tax thing can be an issue. And then because it's so secure, anytime you do buy crypto, you know, you have very specific uh, passwords and private keys. And if you lose your private key, you have lost your money. You know, that's, oh. that's just yeah, what it is. You can't like you know, put in a security question and think it's just going to come back. That's not what it is. Um, it's very very hard to hack into someone's crypto like that it is not um it's not easy to do that at all so oh wow yeah well i tell you you have definitely given some education about this making it more interesting because i do get um you know people who will want to connect with me with regards to cryptocurrency but because i don't know a lot about it you know i just stay back but you know you pique my interest i might say yeah. And so I think yeah. that I will definitely, before this year is out, um, take a more, you know, interested peek at cryptocurrency because they have been talking about a paperless society for at least about 20, 25 years. Yeah. They said one day it's going to be paperless. So then, you know, the um, ATM cards came, right? And then they start using the ATM cards as MasterCards and Visas. Mm -hmm. So you can get to your money now. You know, that has even revved up to the point where you just tap your card. card right. And, and I think I read this, whereas you can have your, your, your products in your, your basket, right? Mm -hmm. And you can scan pay for it and just go out the door and not even go through the checkout lane. Mm -hmm. So there are some things that you're right. The future is here and we, and we must definitely embrace it, but learn about it. So I'm going to call you our cryptocurrency educator when you come oh, back to God. UIN, because we need to know about this. So thank you, Miss English Reed. You are on your work. You are learning and growing. Thank you for educating us. And we know that you're going to be one of those great leaders for us in the future. So thank you so much. Yeah, no doubt. I would definitely say um, if you guys have any extra money, you know, maybe not in a, a good gift would maybe not be like something tangible, but to buy some Bitcoin, buy some Ethereum, maybe some Polygon, right? Just because you know that that is going to increase in value. And so I love when I see, you know, gifts and things like that. You would be surprised how much money you can make in this space. It is crazy. Yes, Polkadot, I agree. Polkadot too, I do have Polkadot as well. Um, I would definitely say, invest and so be it if it doesn't work out oh well but at least you will be on the right side when it does work out so thank you guys so much all right for having me yeah all right everyone that is miss english reed our cryptocurrency educator for uin i already claimed it that's uh, <laughs> that title for us i don't know about anybody else but for us so listen we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back We'll talk about D-Town. Yes, Detroit. What's happening in Detroit? Obviously, cryptocurrency, but there are some other things, too. So stay put and stay connected. And he answered very politely. He said, Dr. Welsing, nearly all of them. But they are ashamed they are afraid to admit it. Now, I can understand that, in other words, this system is about white 
genetic survival. Now, if some people have organized a system for their genetic survival, what's the chance that they're going to give that system up? None. See, they worked hard. And we, we can consider it unjust. It's the most unjust system that has ever been devised on the planet where you have one-tenth of the people deciding that they need to control nine-tenths of the people on the planet. But all along, I maintain we have not understood this. We thought when we were formerly enslaved, if they would just take off the chains, everything is going to be okay. So they removed the chains, and then what did they do next? They put laws in place to accomplish the same thing. And we went through the 1960s in what is being called the Civil Rights Era. And the black people, with all of their dignity and their pride and their courage, going up against horses and hoses and dogs to get the vote, to get that changed. Coming out of that movement, saying black pride, black is beautiful, black power, black self-respect. And the people who had something else in mind said that's dangerous. If people are talking about self-respect and dignity, and I encourage everybody to look at the film's Eye on the Prize and look at those black people, men and women and children going up against a horrific force, but they were determined and they had their self-respect with them, but the system said, this is dangerous. If we let these people go forward, talking about black pride, black dignity, black is beautiful, we will be in trouble. So we have to have something for them. And I maintain that's when they decided, well, we have to feed them Images of superfly, prostitutes, pimps selling drugs, men kicking women, all kind of language. Following that up into the present with having black people call themselves niggers and dogs and gangsters and thugs and bitches and hoes. That's right. That's right. Now, once that's in the brain computer, you can do anything. See, that's the complete annihilation of self-respect. All right, everyone, you are still with Urban Interests. Have you heard about D-Town? D-Town Farms. If you haven't, then we're going to talk with a good friend of ours. We're going to talk with Mr. Malik Yakini. He's going to tell us about D-Town, D-Town Farms, what's happening over there. This is very, very exciting. And so I'm glad that we have an opportunity to talk with him. Come on in here, Malik. Peace, Sister Angela. How are you? Good, good to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. Listen, what, what is D-Town? I mean, I just want to get right into the conversation because it sounds very, very exciting. So D-Town Farm is a seven-acre farm inside Rouge Park. It's right on Outer Drive between Plymouth and West Chicago. And we grow more than 40 different fruits, vegetables, and herbs that we grow organically. And so what we're doing is we're providing high quality, fresh, nutrient-dense produce to Detroiters that is grown by Black people. And uh, we're setting an example of what a closed-loop economy, at least on a microcosmic level, 
might look like. Because right now in our community, as anybody who lives in Detroit knows, the vast majority of the grocery stores in our community are owned by Chaldeans or other people from the so-called Middle East. And I'm not, you know, like smashing, bashing people be, for, because they're Chaldean, but I certainly am opposed to extractive economies where other ethnic groups come into our community, open up all the stores, extract millions of dollars of profit out of our communities, hire very few people from the neighborhoods, and many times treat people in the neighborhoods who allow them to learn, earn their living, treat them disrespectfully. And so, you know, the answer to that, you know, as we've known for some time, is for us to do for ourselves. And so D-Town Farm is a do for self project. It's a community self-determination project where we're not only growing fresh fruits and vegetables and herbs, but we're training people to do that so that we build the capacity within our community to move towards what we call food sovereignty, to have control of the system that provides our food. Now, you just mentioned something that was very, very important. And I think I you know, need to reiterate seven acres. One acre of land is pretty large, but we're talking about seven acres. Yes. That's yeah, and, you know, for an urban farm, our farm is one of the largest urban farms in the country, actually. You know, for, oh, your, your hoop you, keep, drop. you keep going. <laughs> your hoop drop, sis. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, for an urban farm, seven acres is pretty large. But, you know, when I talk to rural farmers and tell them we got seven, far seven acres, they laugh because for a rural farm, that would be pretty small. But for those of us who are, you know, we're relative rookies, even though I've been doing it 20 years, I didn't grow up farming. And so we're still like learning this. And so for us in the city who are learning how to do it, seven acres is a, a gargantuan task. You know, one of the things about farming, there's an African proverb that says, fine words do not produce food. Mm -hmm. Fine words do not produce food. And, you know, in our community, especially among the woke community, we have a lot of people who have a, an abundance of fine words. But as a friend of mine said, usually when all is said and done, there's more said than done. The thing about farming is it's more than fine words. It's actual, it takes actual work and you have a product at the end. It's not just rhetoric. It's not just the theory. It's not just an idea, but we're producing something by the grace of the almighty and the rain and the sun and the earth and all that. We're producing something that can actually sustain our lives. Malik, is it seasonal? It is seasonal. Actually, the farm closed for the season on the 21st of November to the public. We still have staff who are out there working, kind of wrapping things up, but we're not really growing crops during the winter. There are ways to grow crops during the winter, but it's uh, fairly expensive and we're not, you know, for us, it's better just to stop in, at the end of November and then we pick back up in March. And so we take those three months off, we do planning, we buy seeds, and we assess what happened the previous year, then we go right back into it in March. All right. Sounds amazing. So what has been your most contribution to the city? Well, I think the contribution that we've been able to make, uh, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, is raising the issue of Black people being in control of our food system. And of course, this is not a new issue. I want to put this within historical context and say that very early on, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam was really setting the example and creating the template of creating an alternative Black food system with farms that they owned in Mississippi, I'm sorry, in Georgia, Alabama, Michigan. Uh, some people may remember those who are as old as me uh, or so which is pretty old, may remember in Detroit on Joy Road near Dexter, there was your supermarket, which was owned by the Nation of Islam. And there were other your supermarkets in Chicago and other cities across the country. They owned a poultry slaughtering company. They owned a, a trucking company. And so they put all the elements in place to be able to produce food and move it across the country to black communities. And so we have that template. We now need to build on that. And then also I want to, uh, uh, particularly since you're an engineer as a long-term member of the Shrine of the Black Madonna, I want to also lift up the Pan-African Orthodox Christian Church and say that they've also been in the forefront of this work. In the uh, 1970s, I believe, early 1970s, they had a farm in um, a near Inkster, Michigan, where they were producing food and learning farming skills. And for the last several years, they've owned Beulah Land in South Carolina, where they own uh, uh, several hundred acres 
and are both doing cattle and I, I, I think they're still doing fish and various types of uh, plant foods. So we have this these examples before us of black people creating food systems so that we're not dependent upon other people for something that our life needs to survive. And to be honest with you, we've been doing this. We've been, we, we've been doing the farming. You know, yeah. when we go back to the historical time of slavery, we have been doing this. We are the original farmers, I would say. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. I mean, we're the original people, first of all. So, yeah. so all the arts and sciences originated with us because for, <laughs> for hundreds of thousands of years, we were the only human beings on the planet. So mm -hmm. absolutely, agriculture uh, was developed by African people and developed to a high level in the Nile Valley region in ancient Kemet. Uh, and there's all kinds of things that we can read about, like if you read Blacks and Science by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, he talks about some of the early development of agriculture and animal husbandry in Africa. What some people don't make the connection with, though, is the reason we were picked for enslavement. One of the reasons is because of this advanced agricultural knowledge that we had. And in some cases, slavery was targeted. Like uh, some people may know that they grow rice in the South Sea Islands and off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia. That commercial cultivation of rice began by importing Africans, enslaving Africans from Sierra Leone who had those rice growing skills and they brought them here and taught the white people how to grow rice. So yes, we've been doing it and we're still doing it. All right, we can definitely go into conversations about that. Um, so tell me, what is, um, is the store you're building a combination of your vision or is this phase two? Uh, so when the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network started in 2006, mm -hmm. we had several objectives. One of them was to start a farm that was at least a two acre farm. And we talked pretty extensively about that D-Town farm. Uh, one of the other goals, though, from the very beginning was to start a food co-op. And so uh, we've been working on it diligently since 2010, but the idea emerged within our organization in 2006. So it's an idea that we have had from the very beginning, and we've been working on to manifest for over a decade, and we're very close mm -hmm. to this happening. Okay. So what additional products would you carry? Um... And in selecting those products, tell us why those particular ones. Okay, the, D the Detroit People's Food Co-op, first of all, is the name of the grocery store that we're developing. Okay. And let, let me say right from the beginning that if people want information on the Detroit People's Food Co-op, they can go to the website, www.DetroitPeople'sFoodCoop.com. Again, that's www.DetroitPeople'sFoodCoop.com. You can get information on the co-op there, you can join the co-op. The <laughs> co-op is going to be located inside a building that the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network is building along with our development partner, Develop Detroit, on the southeast corner of Woodward and Euclid in Detroit's North End. The building is going to be a two-story, a new, brand new two-story, 31,000 square foot building. <laughs> the Detroit People's Food Co-op, this grocery store will occupy the entire first floor on the second floor, we'll have four shared use kitchens, a 3,000 square foot community a meeting space and office space. Now to your question about what products we'll sell in the Detroit People's Food Co-op, 80% of the product line in the store will be what we call natural and organic. Uh, these will be foods that are grown without chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers, without mm -hmm. artificial colorings and things like that, foods that promote health. The other 20% of the foods will be what we call clean conventional foods. They might not be certified organic foods, but they're grown without the most and packaged without the most egregious chemicals. And so again, our idea is to promote foods that promote optimal health and life. Um, we'll also be selling produce from D-Town Farm and produce from other local farms in the city of Detroit. So we're connecting the agricultural part, the production side with the retail side. And again, this is part of an effort to create a complete food system that we have control of, not just growing the food, but be being able to distribute it, being able to process it, and being able to sell it on the retail level, and keeping all of that money with inside of our community so that we don't have to go beg other people for jobs. <laughs> I like it, like especially that last part, 
begging other people for jobs. You know, we're just in this particular uh, uh, time in history where we are seeming to have to fight for everything, you know, on every level we're yeah. fighting. So I won't get into that conversation. I'm gonna stay right in this conversation <laughs> with you. So uh, tell me, how can the community help out with what you just, with the information you just shared about the D-Town Farms as well as this um, cooperative? So when D-Town Farm opens back in March, we would invite people to come out and volunteer with us and learn the basics of urban agriculture. And so many people come out to the farm just because they want to know the basics. How do you plant tomatoes? How do you plant onions? And mm -hmm. they work side by side with us and learn those skills. Then they can go back home and do that in, either in a backyard garden or a side lot garden or in uh, containers. Um, so that's one opportunity for people to volunteer. The second opportunity would be for people to purchase produce from us. And usually in about May is when we start having some of the crops. We might have a few in April, lettuce and spinach and what we call cool weather crops. But then it's May and June that the majority of the crops start coming in. And so we have a farm stand at the farm every weekend, every Saturday and Sunday morning from June until October. And they can come there and purchase those things at the farm stand. And we also have an online ordering system. I won't go into that now, but I'll just say if people want more information on D-Town Farm, or well, the other work of the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, they can go to our website, which is www.dbcfsn.org. Again, that's www.dbcfsn.org. Mm -hmm. okay. if, if people are interested in, the, in joining or supporting the Detroit People's Food Co-op, the cooperatively owned grocery store. And I, I didn't say that. Let me just say quickly that this, that what makes this store different is it's not owned by a corporation. It's not owned by one or two individuals. We currently have more than 1,400 members. Wow. And so, member, in fact, member owners. And so, by paying a $200 fee, you become an owner of the business. And so, the, the, the business is cooperatively owned, it's not owned by one, any one or two individuals. And we think in the face of a capitalist economy that the best opportunity that we have for our collective advancement is through cooperatives. You know, come on, Malik, $200 fee. Now, is this an annual fee, one-time one -time fee? One-time fee, one-time lifetime fee. Really? Yeah. Wow. And, and then so the, other thing, the other thing about a co-op is in any year the store is profitable, the owners get a percentage of the profit. So it's not like <laughs> Sam's Club where you buy a membership and you can go shop there, but you have no say so, and you certainly don't profit from the store. So this is actually owned by people in the community. All right, and so if someone wanted to get in on the membership um, and become an owner, um, how does that happen? What they can they join right on our website, which again is www.detroitpeoplesfoodcoop.com. You can go right on the website and you can join there and then we'll send you all the membership documents that you need, keep you informed on the meeting so you can be a full participant. See, that's the thing about a co-op too. It's not just mm -hmm. that we cooperatively reap the benefits, we have to cooperatively make the thing happen too. And so when you become a member owner, the expectation is you'll get on one of our working committees and do the work to bring this thing into being. Wow, I love it. So I let, have let, to let me sister, let me end by saying that we're going to, begin construction on this building early next year and the co-op in the building will open in june of 2023 oh i'm so excited i'm so excited to hear that um now i have to ask this question because it's um is it's, it's here about molly Watt. tell yes, us about yes. that <laughs> yeah so i play guitar and i've been playing guitar for a very long time since the early 1970s when i 1970 in fact when i first heard Jimi hendrix but i lead a band in detroit currently called molly Wap. And we play all kinds of music. We play funk, we play reggae, we play R&B, we play soul, we have hip hop. And some songs incorporate all those elements. So we play black music. And you know, this thing of genres is something the music business created, you know, where you have R&B on one station and jazz. You know, we live in Detroit where all those elements are part of our experiences. So all of that comes across in our music. But the main thing is we play music that is positive and uplifting and encourages black people to do something about the position that we're in. So people can check us out. You know, we play around the city frequently. 
uh, you know, things slow down during the winter. This past year, we did a lot of outdoor festivals and there's not many outdoor things now. But when we start playing again in the spring and summer, people can come out and check us out live. Uh, people can uh, hear our music on YouTube. We have an album out called Stand Up. It's on YouTube. It's on Spotify. People use Spotify. It's on Apple Music. It's on all the streaming services. Uh, you know, you can get in and check it out. Then also Molly Wap has a website which you might want to check out and you can see video clips of our performances. You can hear songs. You can uh, get the lyrics to all of our songs if you really want to get deeply into what we're really saying. And um, you can be informed of our upcoming shows. And the website for Molly Wap is www.mollywapjams.com. And that's spelled M-O-L-L-Y W-O-P J-A-M-S dot com. Mollywapjams.com. Mm. All right, Malik, you have just dropped the mic on this segment of Urban Interest. I'm so excited about what's going on. You know, sis, I might have dropped the mic, but what I did do, I didn't throw the mic like uh, Busy Bone did last night in the versus contest with uh, Three Six Mafia. I don't know if you saw that. I but didn't. They had, see <laughs> had a conflict. He not only he didn't drop the mic, he threw it at Juicy J from. Uh, so yeah, I, I might have dropped it, but I didn't throw it. Well, you know what? It was a good it was a good drop for our urban interest segment today on a high note. All the information that you gave. I'm going to uh, check out the Detroit People's Food Co-op. I think it's just, you know, it's awesome that this is something that's here and you can be an owner participant. And I am very interested in that. So thank you, thank you so much for the information. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for continue that. to do what you do. Um, hopefully, we're going to see uh, Molly Wap uh, in person. Yes, hopefully so <laughs> soon. Okay. All right. All right, everyone. Malik Yakini, our good friend, he will come back and speak with us and kind of let us know um, up in 2022, you know, what's going on with Detroit uh, D-Towns Farms, as well as check out that cooperative that he gave us some information about. My friend, have a great weekend, and we Thank will you see much. you soon. Thank you. All right. All right, everyone. What a great segment. We're going to take a quick break and we'll come back and, and we'll wrap this up. Stay put. Today, we bring you the first part of our global broadcast exclusive conversation. The streets of Tahrir have once again been filled. Key issues here at the United Nations Climate Change Conference remain unresolved. Police are saying the protesters to move further and further away. Yeah. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. I'll bring them down. Some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now! All right, that is this segment of Urban Interest. We thank you so much for joining us. Again, we talked about the great resignation. People are just quitting jobs, one job, going to the other job. It is a workers' um, economy. And this is something that we haven't seen in quite a long time. And I don't know, I haven't seen it in my particular um, history. However, this is what's happening. Jobs are all over. You want a job, there's a job that's there. But employers got to be mindful that uh, workers want fair wages as well as benefits. So something has to give on both ends. And then we talked about the Omicron variant of COVID-19. We'll keep you abreast on those that particular news, but you can research it for yourself, as well as Soul Train is celebrating its 50th anniversary. We thank Mr. Don Cornelius for his legacy that lives on from generation to generation. You wanna know about cryptocurrency? English Reed is the person that you can connect with. As I said, she is our cryptocurrency um, educator. So we'll bring her back on to talk about some of those other particular cryptocurrencies. And then D-Town Farms, as well as Detroit People's Food Co-op, get in on that to be an owner participant. And I will agree with Malik that we have to really um, uh, bring ourselves into doing and, and uh, creating that particular wealth, creating those systems for ourselves. Farming, agriculture, that's been with us from the beginning. And so you heard a little bit about that history. So connect with Malik. All right, connect with us on our urban.interest, urban.interest, Instagram or DetroitIPTV.com. 
our YouTube page and our UIN Broadcast Network. We're going to come back on Monday and we're going to talk with a couple of people from um, the elections. We're going to talk about Mr. Roy McAllister, McAllister, sorry about that, and Mr. Attorney Todd Perkins. A lot of information is going on. Stay put, stay connected. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.